Good morning, church. <clears throat> Isn't it good to be in God's house? Love it, love it. I understand there is a bet going on, a pool that's over $100 now of how long I'm going to last in this coat. We don't bet here, just so, just so you know. That's just a figure of speech there. Okay, we're not encouraging that, but it is over $100 if you want in on it. So just, just kidding, just kidding. I don't know how long I'll last. I actually am a little cold, but um, I don't think I'm going to make it through the whole thing. So just so you know, let me ask you all a question. Is there anyone here who honestly likes to fly? Show of hands. Anybody? No way. Are you serious? You like? All right, let me ask it. Is there anyone here like me who hates flying, Does, can't stand it? Yes. Not fly like personally, but like <laughs> fly on a jet. I guess I need to be more literal. <laughs> I can't stand flying. Y'all know that. It's just every time I go, inevitably, I get stuck in the middle seat between these two guys. For some reason, I'm always between this huge leather-clad dude who's drooling and sleeping on me or some roid rage, seven-foot-tall giant wrestler who has the flu. You know what I'm talking about? Well, the coronavirus or something going on, and, I'm all, I just, and I can't stand it because I can't think, I can't relax, I can't work. I can't do any of the things I want. Why? Because I don't have enough space. I don't have enough freedom. And I feel trapped. I can't call anybody for help. What are they going to do? You know, I, I can't move. I, I can't, I'm certainly not going to move those guys. And space is the thing that we need to give us that mental freedom, that margin that we've been talking about. It's what allows us to be thoughtful and intentional with how we live our lives. When we have mental space, we make good decisions. And the opposite of that is true. When we don't have mental space, when we're stressed out, we make bad decisions. He chose poorly. It's one of those things where you don't realize that you're being affected, but you are. If you're not sure, just ask your family because you come home and you're kind of squinting. You know what I mean? You're just like the day has just beat you up. And you have that mental stress where you're carrying the weight of the world. So today we are going to start a brand new series that is all about making space. I don't know how long it'll last, maybe three, maybe four weeks so that we don't restrict the ability to live the lives God is calling us to live, where we have the freedom to move and act and respond the way he does. And to do that, we have to make room in our minds and our hearts to understand our relationship with stuff, with our possessions, and with our finances, even with our money, because this stuff will affect you. Statistics will tell you, just ask any counselor, go to any pastor, say, what is the number one thing you counsel about? And it's financial stress. Because there is no pressure like financial pressure. Can I get an amen? Yes, yes, you're free here. You're safe here. It's okay. There is no pressure like So this series is all about making sure you have space to be who God is calling you to be. And right now, I imagine if we're honest, a lot of us feel like we are that guy stuck in the middle between two hairy dudes, and you are not liking the view, and you are not liking the feeling, and you feel this, this trapped where you can't even work or rest or focus the way you want to. Now, most of us, whether you're aware of it or not, develop our financial habits from a lifetime of good and bad money lessons. So what we're going to do is I want you to go back in your mind to the very earliest memory you have of money. Okay? Your very earliest memory. It could be real money. It could be your first job. It could be your first allowance or your first precious gift that someone gave you. Don't think super hard, but what is it that pops into your mind? It could be Monopoly money. For me, growing up, I had an older brother who got a job long before I was just a, you know, a little whippersnapper, and I loved when he would cash his paycheck because he'd come home and he would break all the, the big bills into singles and quarters and like silver coins. And he had this huge like German like stein, you know what I'm talking about, like we, you know, we drink your Diet Coke out of, and he had it filled with all this money. And anytime I needed money, I just went and grabbed some. It was awesome. I had an endless jar of Jeff. That was my older brother's name. And I hope he's not watching because I don't know that I've ever confessed this, but apparently we did. And I would go in, and if I wanted to go to 7-Eleven on my little scooter, you know, my little thing, I'd go and get a big gulp or 17 candy bars, possibly a true story. And when I ran out of money, I'd just go back to Jeff because Jeff had a jar. Don't you wish you had Jeff's jar? Everybody needs a jar of Jeff. And I would go, and I would grab a handful of quarters or dollars or whatever it took. I just, it was endless. It was awesome. It wasn't until later I realized it's probably called stealing. It's probably bad. 
But these were life lessons. And when I got my first bank account, it came with this glorious plastic card called an Atom or an ATM card. Do you know about these? You can put them in this device, enter a magic code, and out pops money. It's awesome. Especially to a 16-year-old who you get your first paycheck, man, you feel like a millionaire. And I would go and I would just withdraw. I'm like, how much you, you want some? You want some? Hey, stranger, you want some? Check this out. Look at, and money would come out. And then somebody says, do you have any idea what your balance is? I'm like, I don't know. Let's ask the ATM. Surely it's accurate. So I'd go, and I'm like, oh, it says I've got plenty of money left. Y'all, this transferred into adulthood when I would write checks and checks and checks, and then things would bounce. And I said, that's impossible. I still have checks in my checkbook. There's no way. I still have, I have to have more money. And we were forming habits based on childhood. And we carry these into today. So if you are ready to dive in, we're going to have some fun with this. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 25 or pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the NLT translation. So if you want to sync up with me while you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us. I know a lot of you are homesick with the flu. We're praying for you. Get better. Come back and join us. And if you're a first-time guest here in the big room and you made the effort to get dressed and come out and you're not wearing a mask and you're not freaking out over the end of the world, God bless you. You made it. And I think you're safe here and we are grateful to have you with us. Today we're going to look at one of the most famous parables that Jesus dealt with in dealing with our stuff, our time, our treasure, our talents. And we're going to see some powerful truths to understanding our stewardship story. And it is so, so fascinating because this is a topic that is so undertaught today. And unless you've been in church growing up, you may never even heard these truths. So follow along. Matthew 25, we're going to start in verse 14. We're going to read the whole parable. Starting in verse 14, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. By the way, this is a parable. It means it's an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. So be re look for the double meaning. Okay? Hint. There is one. Okay? It's not just the surface. There's a spiritual meaning going on here. All right? Verse 15. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Okay, remember that. He then left on a trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. Verse 18. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. He literally buried it, okay? Verse 19, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Did you catch that? Verse 20, the servant to whom had been entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling the small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. Okay, so he doubled it as well. The master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops where I didn't plant and gathered crops where I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered... Take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To the one who used well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant out into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. There is so much packed in it. To have more financial space, the very first thing we have to understand is this huge truth. 
Everything I have belongs to God. Everything. And we just sang it. It's your breath filling my lungs. We can't even generate the oxygen it takes to keep us alive. That's how good and faithful God is. He is literally providing our next breath. We see in this parable, to be entrusted with something means you're trusted. Duh. How may, think about this. This is, a, this is a hidden gem right here that a lot of people miss. And it dawned on me this week as I was studying this. This is unheard of. Here is an owner with great wealth, vast, vast amounts of silver, and he's giving his wealth and putting it in the hands of a servant. Who does that? Think about this. The master entrusted his own resources to his servants. Now, that is so revealing because it's actually a compliment. To be entrusted with something means that someone trusts you with something. And in our case, God sees you and I as being worthy of his trust with all the things he's entrusted, your skills, your talents, your possessions, everything we have here on earth. And once we grasp this, it begins to change how you view your responsibility for these possessions. See, it's the difference between being a homeowner and a renter. It's the difference between being a landlord and a tenant, right? In your house, you give your kid a bedroom, most of us, right? And that bedroom is their domicile, right? They come and, and then as they get older, they develop a little bit of an attitude. They come and this is my space. This is my space, Mom. You can't do nothing about it. And they slam that door. And you quickly remind them, you slam that door one more time, I'm taking your door. You won't have it. You don't, you don't even have a room. That's your room, but not really. That's my room. This is my house. These are my rules. And you think you, are you paying for that room? I don't think so. See what I'm saying? So it's kind of a, it's their room, but it's not really their room. The tenant is responsible to be a good steward of the property you are giving them. Hear that, kids? saying your parents paid me to say that by the way today that you are responsible not for everything but you are responsible for being a good tenant and the landlord is the one who owns this and in our case god is the ultimate owner he is the true landlord so to speak look at psalm 24 1 it says this the earth is the lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it now if you've never been taught this or you didn't grow up in church this may be a new concept and you think it's does God really own all the money that I work hard for? How, how is that fair? But if you think about it, whatever it is you do to provide for your family, that's a gift from God. Your livelihood, your talents, your skills, everything you do, even the opportunities that allow you to earn the money are only yours because God allows it. So yeah, even the skills and the talent we have belong to God. He's been your silent partner, your key investor, your biggest cheerleader behind the scenes whether you knew it or not all along he has been there and the fact that everything belongs to god should be great news for us because when you let that sink in we realize we're just here to manage the property in our lives we don't have to stress to be in the owner that's up to him and that's the good news when we accept that it frees you of that stress it frees you of the burden of having to carry everything yourself now when things are tight Maybe you feel like, you know, sometimes I don't think God's entrusted me with a whole lot. Or what you have given me, Lord, is not quite sufficient. Now, we're going to have a little talk about that. I need you to up the, uh, the quotient here. Because when we're struggling, it's hard to think of the little we have as being a blessing. So Jesus actually addressed this in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, look what he says. He says, don't worry about these kind of things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Not us as believers. Your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he might give you some of what you need. Oh, you're starting to say that? You're starting, are you sure? Because that's how a lot of us live sometimes. What it really says is he will give you everything you need. And when we accept the idea that every good thing comes from God, it makes space inside us to live with gratitude for what we have. When we realize that it is an honor to be trusted by the creator of the cosmos. And he gives you these things. And it reminds us our faith, our good management of God's gifts results in his blessing and his care for us. What a promise. This is so humbling and empowering 
to know we are not just the own, we're, we're not owners of possessions, but we are just the managers. We're temporary stewards of the things he's blessed us with. I remember when my dad embraced this truth, it radically changed him. I got to see a total 180, and it freed him up, and he began to see things from a heavenly perspective. After I got my first, I can't make it. After I got my first, <laughs> you all are wondering, weren't you? I got my first driver's license, 16 years old. My dad bought me a Jeep Comanche. I've showed it before. It's a black Jeep. Oh, it's so cool. Love that truck. I would sleep in it and everything. So I went and I drove it around and I promptly wrecked it. Like, still being 16. Well, then I learned a new lesson called insurance. And I said, hey, Dad, what happens now? And he goes, well, son, I insured it. So we're actually going to get more for it than I paid for it. It's going to be awesome. I was like, can't wait to see what you buy me next. And he said, oh, son, oh, sweet, sweet, dear 16-year-old son who knows nothing. You're being demoted. I'm not buying you a new car. In fact, you're being demoted. This is now your new car. <laughs> yes, true story. The 1977 metallic pea green Plymouth Volari. <laughs> not Ferrari, Volari. Huge difference. So I, I was in a, you know, in a band. I was in high school, and I, I could not be seen in this. It was so embarrassing. My dad, however, had just bought him a brand new black Cutlass Sierra GT. It was the sweetest ride. It was black with silver flake in it. You know what I'm talking about? The closest thing I can give you a picture is Smokey and the Bandit with that gold Firebird on the hood, but instead of gold, it was silver. And it was so fast. And I remember coming downstairs into the garage. He was polishing it up. And I was like, hey, Dad, do you think I can? He's like, no. <laughs> no. 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 Are you crazy? Don't even look at it. Go away. <laughs> Just turn. Why are you breathing in its direction? And I would be like, Sorry. One day he came home from church, and God got a hold of him, and it was glorious. I come walking downstairs. I say, Dad, i got to go run an errand. I'll, I'll be back in a minute. He goes, you want to take the GT? I said, What's that? You want to take the GT? I'm like, are you? That's just mean. If, don't, don't you play with me. Do me the keys. He said, you know what? God spoke to me about this and said, I realize I've been holding things too light. Too, too, too tightly, and I need to hold things looser because I was starting to make things an idol. And uh, God spoke to me about it, and you know what? It's all his. All this material stuff, everything. And I said, are you serious? He said, his next words, I'll never forget. He said, if you ever need it, just ask, because it's God's. It's not mine. I'm just a temporary steward of it. Wow. You think I took it? Absolutely, I took it. You know it. And I wrecked it. No, I didn't. I did, but <laughs> I didn't drive it much because I was nervous. Y'all, the first key to getting space in our mind is to realize everything in my life belongs to God. He has simply entrusted it to me. The second key we get from this parable is that God wants us to be good managers of what he's entrusted to us. He wants you to succeed in this area. He wants you to be a good manager. It's all his. We just get the privilege of managing it for him. And he wants us to do it well. Look at the next verse in the story, verse 19. He says, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Okay? So the master in this, this is the Lord. He is coming back. He returns. And the guy misjudged him. The wicked servant called him gracious and, and, and didn't do all that stuff. He didn't even have the proper respect here for this. And now he's coming back and he wants to see how you did. So the first step we just talked about, we understand everything we have belongs to God. The next step is to be good stewards of this. And this is something we can all get better and better with, no matter how good you think you are. This goes beyond being good with numbers. I'm not talking about being a good entrepreneur. I'm not talking about having some bizarre, unnatural, nerd-like understanding of hedge funds. I am talking about becoming a good manager of our finances to be a good steward to please him, being diligent with what he has given us. So you know i got to ask. How are you doing with that? If you had to rank yourself, how are you doing with that? Mom, dad, how are you doing with teaching your kids financial responsibility? Because I promise you, they are not hearing this in school. They're hearing how to get credit card notes and loans and rack up mass amounts of debt. Do you have room for improvement here? Absolutely. I think we all do. Knowing that is half the battle. That's okay. You're safe here. We all fail to be good stewards at some point. The key is to know why we fail to honor God here, why we fail to be good stewards. Take a look at the servant with the one talent, the one bag of silver. Look at verse 25. He says, I was afraid I would lose your money, 
so I hid it in the earth. But look, here's your money back. Y'all, y'all know anybody who actually does this, who buries money in the backyard? Your great-grandparents, if they went through the Great Depression, they did this. There are people who would literally come and they would cash their resources and they would put them in mason jars and dig them. And under the light of the moon, you could see like holes all over the yard where they would be burying stuff. I guarantee you, it gets no interest. There is nothing to be gained from that. It might be safe unless your neighbor sees you doing it. This is what he's saying. He says, so I hid it. So look, here's your money back. Look closely. What was it that made him fail? So I was afraid. And there it is. Fear. Fear is the word that jumps out at you. Fear of failure. It caused him to not do anything. It caused him not to take any risk. He didn't, but he played it safe. And I think when you only have one of something, you kind of cling to it even more. My precious. It's just my, and, and you cling to it so tightly that you're scared to give it up because you're scared you're going to lose that. And I think all of us have felt like that servant at one point or another. Whenever we have a little or a lot, sometimes we find ourselves acting out of fear, fear of failure, fear of loss, fear that we're going to make bad choices. The way to reduce the fear, though, is to bring them into the light. You remember when you were a kid, and you would lay down in bed, and you just knew there was a monster in your closet. Or maybe you saw something at the foot of your bed, some bizarre shape. Like, if you looked at it, you couldn't quite see it, but if you looked this way, because you can kind of see better out of the corner of your eye, you're like, there's somebody standing right there. There's a VeggieTales about this, which is so good. The shadow right here is something horrifying, and he's so scared and it's like, like, as long as I have my feet under the covers, nothing can grab me. But if I put my foot outside the covers, that thing's going to grab my toes or something. You know what I'm talking about? And, but as long as I'm here, I'm safe, right? As long as we just kind of stay in our little fear zone, we're petrified and we're paralyzed. We don't do anything. But it wasn't until we got the courage to reach over and turn on the light that we said, it was just a, a backpack, like with a sweater on or something, or a feather duster or something at the end of the bed. It was nothing. Do you see what just happened right here? The fear made us believe things that simply weren't true. And it paralyzed us. Just like this servant. The same thing happens in our finances today. So today, we say, enough. Today, we drag it into the light. We let God's word shine a bright light on it, and we face them. So we're going to do this right now. We're going to take an inventory. Every one of us, you don't have to answer out loud yet, but I'm going to show some options up here. And I just want you to see where are you in your financial journey. Not how much money you have in the bank, not where you got your CD on deposit or any of that stuff. I just want to know, in a broad, general view, how do you feel with where you are today? Do you have any peace? Has it been robbed? Do you have any space to do things for the kingdom? So here it is. Option one, I require financial assistance to get by. Okay, things are so tight, I'm not even making it. I have to. If I didn't have help, I would surely go under. Okay? Option two, I'm struggling to keep up with day to day expenses. I can make it some weeks are tight, but you know, it's a struggle, and I have no peace in that. Option three, I'm able to make ends meet. Okay? That's about it. Okay? God's provided. I'm doing okay. I don't have anything left over, but I'm not going into further debt. Okay? I'm able, I'm just right here. I'm just able to make ends meet. Option four, I'm able to make ends meet and have some left over. Okay, cool, good for you. And then there's option five. I have more than I need for myself, my family, my friends. Okay, everybody got which option they are? Okay, all right, show of hands. How many people, I'm just kidding, I'm not kidding, we're not going to do that. This is for you. This is for you and you alone. Where are you on this list? See, acknowledging where we are is the step we need to take to shine God's light on it. If we are struggling, like that fearful servant was who just had the one bag of silver, then we need to know we got to work a little harder to trust God and not be fearful. When we live in fear, that is not where God wants us to live. Maybe we're option three, option four. Or maybe we're still stuck somewhere between one and two, and we gotta, we got to lean on our friends, and we got to lean on our family. Maybe you got to lean on your church. That's what we're here for. Perhaps you find yourself all the way down to option five, maybe option four or five, and you think, you know what, I've got challenges too, because now I've got a challenge of making sure my possessions don't have me, instead of me just having possessions. And maybe you struggle with things, having that power over you, and we're going to talk more about that in the weeks to come. Knowing where we are is the first step into getting where God wants us to be.
So now that we've faced our fear of finances, what's the next step? How do we find that faith? How do we embrace faith over fear? Remember, everything you have is a gift from God. And he promises he will continue to take care of you. He will provide for you. You may not realize that, but here's the truth. God has entrusted you with what you have for a reason. He has entrusted you with exactly what you have for a reason. Everything you have is by design. It is not an accident. So God gives you wisdom to help you be a better manager. Increasing your financial wisdom helps you trust God more. Think about the scripture today. Despite the fact that each of the good servants got different amounts, guess what was, what was rewarded? Their behavior. Don't miss that. Both of them, being a good manager, the behavior was what the master cared about. They both were rewarded, even though they didn't begin with the same amount. Don't miss that. And they didn't end with the same amount. The bottom line is, it didn't matter how much you have. What matters is what you do with what he's given you. That's huge. What matters is what you do with what you have. Are you faithful with it? Are you being wise with it? Are you blowing it on stupid stuff? Are you getting in further debt to where you are such bondage, you can't help anybody if you wanted to? Are you so overextended? Have you been foolish? Or maybe are you hoarding it? Thinking like, like my dad with his car, it's my precious, it's right? It's the, only thinking of yourself and ignoring the one who gave you what you have. So we apply the biblical wisdom, like Proverbs 27 tells us this. It says, riches can disappear fast, so watch your business interests closely. Know the state of your flocks and your herds. I don't know if any of you got flocks or, or herds. Well, Leanne does. Leanne's got chickens, right? Yeah, you got, is that a flock? Herd? What do you, okay, all right. So I'm big into farming, you can tell. Whether it's your checking account, your savings account, whatever it is, God wants you to pay attention to how you are using what he has given you. He doesn't call every one of us to be an accountant, thank you, Lord. But he does call every one of us to be accountable for what he's given you. One day we will give an account of that. Most of us have had a time or two in our lives where the last thing we wanted to do was be accountable. We didn't even want to look at our bank account. We just like, I don't even want to check it because something probably went through that I forgot about. Y'all, that's living in fear. And we got to break that. That is not where God has called you to live. He wants you to be a good manager of these things that he's given you, of the talents he's given you, of the treasure and the time. Every financial decision is an opportunity to bless others and advance the kingdom. And when you start looking at that, it changes everything. When we realize we're just managers. God has to carry the burden of being the provider. And then we start seeing that every financial decision actually it's a spiritual decision. When you start to see that, it gives you space in every other area of your life. How we handle our finances says a lot about what's important to us. If you wanted to find out more than you needed to know about a single person, and you couldn't ask them one question, all you'd have to do is say, can I see your checkbook register? Can I see your QuickBooks account? And you would see what was important. You'd see what was also not important right? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we see this, and it reveals so much volumes about whether he is Lord or we are Lord. Whether we truly recognize that he is the one we put our trust in or the way we put our, things, our trust in things for our security. So now that we know that everything belongs to God and he wants us to be good managers of the things he's given us, this brings us to the last key, to having more financial space and less stress. And this is the, such, a, such a cool part. God will reward good managers. Don't miss that. There is a reward here. How cool is it? When we read the end of the parable, God is saying this. He says, you've done such a great job with the little bit I've given you. I am going to trust you with even more. Look at verse 21 with me. He says, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Oh, that is so amazing to be trusted by God with more. There's a lot of good people who are asking God for more, but they're not even being faithful with what God's already given them. You know how you feel when your 10-year-old comes up and they've just blown through an incredible amount of money that you've given them, and they go, I don't have any. Dad, can I have some more? It's like, no. <laughs> You didn't even use what I, what'd you spend it on? I bought nerds, you know, and it's like, 
How many? A case. That's not smart. Why would I give you more? Why would I enable you to do something like that? You know, and the idea of being blessed with more is all throughout Scripture. When you are faithful with what God has trusted you with, he gives you additional resources. He sees, in fact, when we see the millennial kingdom, he will reward you. Remember, he says we will serve alongside. You've got the throne of David, and you will be given provinces. Some of you will be governors. Some, we forget this. But he is going to reward you in the future life with how we are handling this current life. This is amazing. Even if we don't seem to have any money now, when we're afraid of facing our finances, when we give this fear up, it takes up less room in our lives, and it stresses us out less. And the space gives you an opportunity for every other area of your life to flourish, your health, your marriage. Think of all the times we've wished for more time, more energy, more, more money to do things for God. When we start honoring God with good stewardship and pleasing him, it makes space in every other area of your life. The number one cause of divorce today is finances and pressure that comes from that. And when you surrender that to the Lord and say, God, I am done carrying this. I've made a mess of it. I give. What are your biblical principles? Help me. This is where we start to experience unexpected benefits. Like, are you ready for this? Gratitude. Thankfulness. It starts to creep into your life from unseen places, and you'll start to see God as your provider in everything. And you'll start to appreciate him even more. You'll realize it's all his, but yet he still gives so much of it to me, pouring it out on me. He'll begin to ask you to bless others. He'll begin to ask you to give some, but he'll say, I want you to keep this too. You keep some. And something surprising happens. You begin to find yourself thankful, not only for what you get to keep, but for what you get to give. And your whole paradigm shifts. You start finding your finances are no longer a stress to you. They bless you. And that is an awesome, freeing place to live. When your finances no longer stress you, they bless you. And you can bless others. One of the most awesome parts of being a pastor is seeing some of you live this out. Truly love God and love others. Where you come to me and you bless somebody anonymously and you say, hey, I heard someone so is having a tough time. I want to give them this. Can you be the go-between so that they don't find out who did it and I have no credit, no glory? I'm like, oh my goodness, yes. That's just amazing. So many of you seated here have done that. And it is beautiful. That is, we are never more like Christ than when we're giving. That's what he did. He gave his life. So we resemble the master our most when we are right here at our best, giving and blessing others. And it is so awesome and encouraging to watch you guys do that. Put your faith in action. Because it all points back to our loving Heavenly Father, who also loves to give good things to his children. So when we do that, we're imitating our Father. And as the scriptures just said, you'll want to celebrate that. And you will want to join that awesome party where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy I've prepared for you. And it is amazing. Let me show you what I mean in a, in a real life uh, Hollywood scenario. In fact, musicians, you guys can go ahead and come on up. We're going to end this way. How many people remember the movie Facing the Giants? Anybody remember the death crawl? Oh, this scene right here is like rocky to me. It's like, doo, 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 doo. it's so awesome. If you're not sure about the death crawl, the coach makes all the football players get on their hands and their feet, not their knees, and then another person has to get on his back, and you have to crawl 5, 10 yards, and then when you get to the end, you swap, and you crawl 5, 10, 20 yards back to the end zone where you start from, and it is brutal. And you don't last very long because it burns, and it hurts. So Brock... The captain of this team one day was living so far below his potential. The coach came and says, do you trust me? Yeah, I trust you. Brock, people are looking up to you, and your attitude stinks. You are not even coming close to your potential. So you're going to do the death crawl. All right, I'll do it. How far you want me to go? 10 yards, 20 yards? You know what? I'm going to put a blindfold on you, and you go until I tell you to stop. All right. So he gets down. The guy gets on his back, and he starts to go. And he's crawling, and he goes 5, 10, 50 yards. He goes, okay, I should be here, coach. And he goes, just keep going. <sighs> it's getting heavy. And he's going, and he's crawling. Finally, he says, y'all, coach, it burns. Can I quit now? Can I be done? And he says, no. 
No, you can't quit. I can't do anymore. I, I, I'm starting to fade. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't quit. I know you're tired. And he keeps going and going and sweat's pouring off him. And he's starting to complain. And the people are starting to stand up and the music swells. And he's going and going. He says, I can't do anymore, coach. And he comes beside him and says, Brock, don't quit. Trust me. I believe in you. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Keep going. I can't. My arms are on fire. I'm going to fail. I'm going to collapse. Keep going. You've got more in you. You have not lived up to your potential. And he's going and going. And finally, he gets to where he is completely spent, and he collapses. And his coach comes beside him, and he says, Brock, take off your blindfold. You're in the end zone. He didn't go 10 yards or 30 yards. He went 100 yards. And he couldn't believe it. When he took off his blindfold, the coach looked at him and said, how do you feel? People are looking to you. You're a leader. And because you trusted me, you went so far above where you've been living because you have settled for something less. I believe in you. Brock, well done. Good and faithful football player. Well done. Look where you are. I'm going to bless you with more leadership. Imagine the relief that we are going to have and the joy and the celebration on that day when God says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Bless you. You have been faithful with this. I will bless you with more. So what about you? Are you trusting your father? He said, oh yeah, I love God. I trust him with everything. Really? Because God points to the checkbook or our, our wallet or our time or our talents and says, I want those. Yeah, you've surrendered that. You've surrendered that. You've, I want that. <laughs> Not that, God. I, mean, I trust you with my eternal salvation, but you can't handle this. Where do you need to step up? What's God calling you to do today? Is he calling you to surrender every aspect of your life, your time, your treasure, and your talent? Just be obedient to him. That's where you make space and you live in peace and freedom that he's called you to do. Let's pray about it. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've called us into more. Lord, make us grateful for your, your provision. Help us to be filled with joy and to celebrate, to walk in peace, knowing that you own everything. Every good thing we have comes from your hand, God. We, we know that. We accept it. We want to believe and walk in faith. Help our unbelief, Lord. Help our walk to match our talk. You have so much you want to bless us with, Lord. Forgive us for not being faithful with what you've already given before we ask for more. But Lord, we surrender today. We don't want to just give you lip service. We want to mean it. So God, would you take control? Would you increase our faith so we can trust you and step out in every area of our life? and believe you will do what you say you'll do. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.